78, 79 message in a series on the person and work of Christ. And lately we've been preaching about Saul of Tarsus, but now he is Paul the Apostle. Because in our last two messages we learned how the Lord met him in Damascus Road, how he saved him and called him. And now we're going to talk about Paul and Jesus from the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. I'd like for you to read with me. At verse 17, if you don't remember what went on before verse 17, I'll remind you. Saul had started down to Damascus with letters in his pocket, if he had a pocket, to arrest all those of Damascus' way that were believers in Jesus. Saul was a rabbi, educated and cultured and brilliant, highly successful, esteemed, thought of very highly in his nation, powerful and with authority from the high priest and from the chief priests. And he seemed to have a personal hatred for the Lord Jesus Christ. He breathed out threatenings and slaughterings. In fact, the Greek brings out that his very heart was filled with murderous intent, jealous of all those who believed in Christ. He set about to be the personal vindicator of God's glory. For he was very zealous toward God, living a blameless life under the law, possessed with self-righteousness. And to him, Jesus was an impostor and one who sought to steal from God the glory that belonged to him. And so Saul, as he confessed later with a pure conscience, thinking that he was doing God a favor, set out for Damascus to destroy the faith that one day he would so earnestly preach. And on the way to Damascus Road, a wonderful thing happened at midday. There was a light from heaven shone round him, the light much brighter than the sun in all of its strength. And from this light and from heaven itself came a voice. This voice called Saul by name and asked him the piercing question, Why persecutest thou me? To which, you remember, Saul was never able to answer. When he asked, Lord, who is it? The answer came back, it is Jesus, whom thou persecutest. He cried out, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And you remember that he was blind, and he was led by the hand down to Damascus and taken to the street called Straight, to the house of one named Judas. And there he abode for three days and nights. In the meantime, a believer in the city of Damascus by the name of Ananias saw the Lord, and the Lord spoke with him and told him to go down to this street and to this particular house and inquire for Saul, for behold, he prayed. Now he said, when you go, Saul has already seen you in a vision. He believes that you're coming to lay your hands upon him, that he might receive his sight, and that he might be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so Ananias objected because Saul had been an enemy of the church. But over the objections of Ananias, the Lord assures him that he is a chosen vessel. And so without further fussing, he goes down to the street called Straight, to the house of Judas, inquires for Saul of Tarsus, finds a poor, humble, blind, praying man who had been brought from such a lofty place to such a low place, to the realization that everything he was before he met Christ was done as he confessed in his testimony, to learn that he had been chief of sinners while all the time supposing himself to be chief among the righteous, that he had learned that he was an injurious and persecutor and a blasphemer when all the time he supposed himself to be the chief servant of God himself. And if no other illustration from the life of Saul remains with you, you should remember the deceptive powers of the human heart how Saul was on a way which seemed right to him, how he was on a way which seemed to him to be the sure way, even, he said, with a pure conscience. Yet when he met Christ, he realized that he was on a way that surely would have ended in death. Ananias came, verse 17 reads, and entered into the house, and he put his hands on him, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, 
that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from their eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. And all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this was the very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gate day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Saul was to be an example to all who would afterward believe, and one of the greatest examples of Saul's life is the example of the infinite grace of God. If I had been God, I would never have saved Saul. He was the chief enemy of God. He had persecuted God's son. He had caused the stoning of Stephen, God's messenger. He had despised the name of God's son, the Lord Jesus. And only grace could save such a wretched sinner as Saul, chief among the sinners, most dangerous, greatest persecutor, worst blasphemer, for he seemed obsessed with a bitterness and a hatred and a wrath toward Christ that was not content in mere arrest of Christians and putting them to death, but many of them he caused to be beaten, and he testified later that he delighted in forcing them to blaspheme the Lord they loved. He was a sadistic, terribly hateful man who was so possessed with the rightness of his own religion that his mind was completely closed to any preaching on the subject of Christ. And it took tremendous grace to reach over the objections of his own heart, to reach him in Damascus Road and reveal Christ to him. But the work was done seemingly in a moment the twinkling of an eye. For he testified later that there in Damascus Road he had seen the Lord, and he was never quite the same after that. What a great example of the long-suffering of God and of the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The chief of sinners has been saved, and if the chief of sinners has been saved, then every sinner on earth tonight can hope in the gospel of the grace of God, for Christ is able to save to the uttermost all who will come to God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Saul saw the Lord, and some immediate changes were brought to pass in his life, and I comment on a few of them, for if you're saved, they will refresh your mind and your memory as to those immediate changes that came into your own heart and life when you first saw the Lord by faith. I like the word immediately, for the Holy Spirit uses it here. Immediately, there fell from his eyes as it had been scaled, and he received sight forthwith. And I'm taking this in a spiritual sense as well as in a literal sense. For when Saul received the Holy Spirit through the hands of Ananias, the scales fell from his eyes literally and figuratively, and he was able to see clearly for the very first time in his life. If you could let your imagination wander for a little bit to what Saul might have seen, what did he see in his heart's eye? He saw, first of all, Judaism for what it was. He saw that every Jewish altar was void. He saw that every sacrifice was meaningless. He saw that every feast was useless. He saw that every offering was unnecessary. He saw that the very nation that just a few hours before he had supposed to be the great nation glorifying God upon earth was the very nation that had blasphemed God by the crucifying of his own son. He saw religion and all of its efforts to self-righteousness as hopeless and useless 
He saw in all that he had been and all that he possessed a vanity that had passed away in a moment of glory when he saw the Lord Jesus as he should have seen him. I like the fact that the very first person he saw was Ananias. The first face he looked upon was the face of a brother in Christ. He saw in Ananias a man he actually had come to Damascus to arrest, for his John Doe warrants were for any in Damascus who called upon that way. Ananias was a man he would have had beaten, imprisoned, and possibly killed had Christ not met him on Damascus Road. And now he looks into the face of a man who just a few hours before he could have hated, could have persecuted, caused to blaspheme and kill. And now he looks upon him, I'm sure, with the love and with the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. The emotional details of this scene are not recorded for us, but Paul was human, so was Ananias. And as I told you Sunday night, I'm sure that when Ananias saw him, humbled and broken, with a contrite heart and tear-filled eye, I'm sure Ananias must have embraced him when he said those wonderful words, Brother Saul. And I'm sure that when he laid his hands upon him, Saul received his sight, and Saul looked upon the face of Ananias, he must have returned that embrace and cried, Brother Ananias. There in the house of Judas, who probably wondered what it was all about, this great rabbi, proud and haughty, powerful and proud, now humbled and broken and filled with the love of Christ, embraces a Christian, calls him brother. Saul can see, and I don't think the great marvel is that he can see as much as the marvel that he now knows that he was blind. For before he met Christ, he supposed he could see. And he was like those Pharisees that Jesus came to. And he said, because you say you can see, you're yet blind. For he thought sight came when a man first realized that he could not see. And Saul not only could see, he realized that for all of these years he'd been blind. I can remember about myself and I can remember that the great marvel, the first great marvel of my heart after the Lord saved me, the thing which grew upon my heart from day to day, and once while just sitting and contemplating on it, I was broken up in tears over the marvel of it. And that was that for so many years I had lived in complete blindness, in complete ignorance, just in a world all my own. And I sat one night and marveled, where have I been for all of these years? What have I been thinking about for all of this time? What has my mind and my heart and my hands been taken up with that for so many years I could live in ignorance of the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ? And the marvel that God, in spite of all of these years, would reach down where I was, find me in the darkness, and under the power of Satan, and of a deceived mind and heart, and with such grace and such power, cause me to see that I might see for the first time the reality of Christ, the loveliness of Christ, and the preciousness of Christ, and the power of Christ to save me in the forgiveness of my sin and for the glory of God. And I know that this wonder must have gripped the heart of Saul down at the house of Judas. You know, it, it was a horrible revelation to him that the one he hated, the one he persecuted, the one he injured, the one he blasphemed, it was a terrible thing to him to discover that this one loved him and loved him in spite of what he had done and loved him in spite of what he was and had pursued him, even when he was breathing out those threatened, threatening and those slaughtering, pursued him even down the dusty roads of Damascus when he was intent on stamping out his very name. 
What a shocking revelation to Saul that this one he had hated so bitterly and so long actually loved him. I can almost see him at times in my mind's eye, sitting there in the house of Judas, shaking his head, tears filling his eyes, saying, Why? I was chief of sinners, injurious, persecuted, blasphemer. Why? Chief of sinners. Ah, he can see now. He sees himself for what he was. And it was not a pleasant sight. This is the man who would later write the book of Romans. And I'm satisfied that what he wrote in those first three chapters about the human heart, he wrote with a pen that was dipped in the inkwell of his own heart. And I think the vivid description that he writes in those three chapters <coughs> is an autobiography of his own poor, wretched heart. This man can see. And this is the immediate result of being saved. We see what we are. We see what we were. We see what Christ is. We see what God is. And these things that we see immediately when we are saved will transform us and change us. For from now on, Saul will never be the same. He will never think the same. He will never see the same. He will never believe the same. He will never act the same. He will never be the same because what he has seen has transformed him and will transform him forever and forever. Now, as I told you before, knowing the life of Paul, 30-some years was passed in the preaching of the gospel. You may read the accounts of his suffering, for God had said through Ananias that he would show him what great things he would suffer for his name's sake. Beaten, persecuted, hated, despised, probably the most disliked and hated man of his time, died friendless practically, penniless, health gone, nearly blind, imprisoned, forsaken, discouraged. But nothing in all of those 35 years could change what he saw there at the Masters. He had seen the Lord, and he had seen himself. And though a thousand devils would be him, and though the world and his own wretched heart would set themselves against him in the years to come, and though even false friends would betray him, loved ones desert him, nothing could change what he had seen at Damascus. He had seen Jesus. He had seen God's crucified Savior. He had seen the wounds in his hands and in his side, and he had realized that he had made those wounds when Jesus came to the house of his friends. He had seen the substitutionary lamb, and he had seen himself as the wretched sinner that lamb died for. And Saul would never, never, never be the same again. Now, you know, I told you that uh, when I was, first became a Christian, I used to wonder how to find out if others were Christians. So I started out, I suppose, with the most general of all questions, asking people if they were a Christian. But I got such general answers because I found out everybody was a Christian. And I remembered then that before I was saved, I thought a Christian was anybody that believed in the existence of a God or a supreme being. So I realized that I wasn't getting any place to ask anybody if they were Christians. So I modified it a little bit and began to ask people if they were saved. And everybody was saved. I began to ask people if they were born again, and everybody was born again. I asked a waitress in a restaurant one time, and she ruined my whole meal, telling me how she was born again when the priest sprinkled her. And I began to modify that question a little bit and ask them if they knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And I found out that many people did, but not all of them knew the same Jesus Christ that I knew. 
And I began to wonder if there was any way to find out whether people really knew the Lord or not. And I think, as you've discovered, because I've told you many times that there is a way to know. I don't think it's in the correct answers that they give us about Christ nor in the correct terminology that they use or theological terms that they may possess. I think the man who really has seen the Lord is the man who has really seen himself. I think the man who knows that the first three chapters of Romans describe him is the man who really knows the Lord because a man can't get saved until he gets lost. He has no need of Christ until he sees in his own poor heart what he is. And this gets hold of me when I study about Saul, that this was the great enlightenment that he had. He saw what he was. When he left Jerusalem for Damascus, do you think he had the slightest idea that he was the chief persecutor of God? chief blasphemer of God on earth, the most injurious person to the cause of God's glory on earth? Do you think that you could have convinced him that he lacked righteousness altogether, that he was godless, unrighteous, on his way to a heathen hell? Do you think anyone could have convinced him that all of his religious works were dung and filthy rags in the sight of God? No, for he was blind. He saw all of those things in an entirely different light. And a thousand orators with silver tongues could never have persuaded him otherwise. This work was done by Christ himself in Saul's heart through the power of the Word and the Holy Spirit. And this is the reason why you cannot argue people into being saved. They must be enlightened of the Holy Spirit, and they must, first of all, like Saul, have the light shine around them that they might see themselves for what they really are. And when they do, they will see in Christ all they need and all they want. This, I still say, is the foremost revelation to the heart of Saul, to see what he was and to see what he is, chief, he says, of sinners. This was no false humility. This was no mock humbleness on the part of Paul. He said he was chief of sinners because in his heart he honestly believed that. As he saw what was within himself, he thought to himself that there could be no man on earth whose heart could be blacker, deeper stained with sin than his own. And even after he had become spiritual father to many, he said, among the saints I am less than the least. For I think Paul carried about with him from that day on a humbleness of heart that forbid him to take any glory for himself or to see any good in himself for remembering the evil that he had seen under the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. And I think people who are really saved are people who have really seen what they are, who really know what they are, who really have discovered by divine enlightenment that they are indeed poor, wretched, ungodly, unrighteous, sinners. Sinners at the mercy of a holy and righteous God. Sinners who deserve hell and eternal separation and eternal condemnation. Sinners who have fallen upon the grace, the same grace that saved Saul at Damascus for their own redemption and for their own salvation. And these two revelations, this twin revelation of our own hearts and of Christ continues through the Christian life as long as we remain upon this earth.
The more we see of ourselves, the more we see of him. And conversely so, the more we see of him, the more we see of ourselves. The more we despair at what we see within, the more we rejoice at what we see in him. The consciousness of sin, the comprehension of sin, I think is one of the greatest blessings that can ever reach the heart of any man. For without the consciousness or the comprehension of sin, there is no comprehension of Christ. So immediately there was a change in Saul. He could see. Not just the room, not just Ananias' face, not just the daylight again, or the street called straight of the city of Damascus. He could see what he could never see before. He could see that Jesus was God Christ. He could see that Jesus was God crucified Messiah. He could see that Jesus was God's sacrificial offering. He could see that Jesus was his substitute and his Savior. He could see that Israel had committed a horrible sin for they had crucified the Lord of glory. And all oh, something else he could see. He saw in his own kinsmen, his brethren after the flesh, a heartbreaking sight. He saw himself a thousand times in the faces of those godly Jews he knew all over Asia and Macedonia and Judea. He saw in the face of every rabbi, of every priest, he saw in the face of every Jewish man and every Jewish woman who went to the temple to make their sacrifices, who went to Jerusalem to observe the feast. He saw in every member of his nation his own life repeated. And he had a compassion for the soul of the Jew that was second to none in his day. And he cried out, I could almost wish myself a curse to God for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. My heart's desire, he wept, and prayer to God is for Israel that they might be saved. Oh, he saw many things that day, and he would never be the same again. Then I noticed that he received meat and was strengthened, and he spent some days with those disciples in Damascus. It's only fitting and proper that the first thing in his Christian life should be food and fellowship. There's a couple of ways to look at this taking food and receiving strength. First of all, he took care of his own body, that it might be used for the glory of God. And secondly, if you want to spiritualize it, this is the first great need in every babe in Christ's life, is to receive the food of the Word of God. Saul was brilliant, he was eloquent, he was educated, he was cultured. But brother, when he got saved, he was a baby. Just as all of us were babies when we were saved, he was a baby too. And even though his eyes had been opened and he could see things that he had never seen before, I bet he had a thousand questions. And I've tried to imagine those days that he spent with those believers in Damascus. Glorious day. Wonderful day. And I look back, and I know you can too. But those first day, fresh day, when we were full of questions, full of zeal, full of wonder, willing to eat anything that was given to us, receive anything that was offered to us, delight in any small thing from the Lord, you remember those precious days spent in fellowship with the saints, how we feasted, how we were strengthened, how we were made strong by that first food and that first fresh fellowship with God's people. <laughs> I know you'll get tired of me saying, uh, try to picture it in your mind, but we've got no place else to look at it. Can you see him there? As I told you Sunday night in the close of the message, I assumed that Ann and I said to him, Brother, if you don't have any plans, come home and stay with me for a few days. I'll call Mrs. Ananias and she can fix up a fresh bed and put something else on to eat and you can come home with me. 
I don't know where he went, but he stayed someplace in Damascus with some of the saints, and I imagine Ananias got that first privilege. So Saul goes home with Ananias, we'll say, for sake of argument. And the saints in Damascus gathered in, not just to see him, to help him, to strengthen him. I think he's too crushed to take any preeminence among them. He's too broken to wax eloquent. He doesn't know anything except what he learned on Damascus Road. He's seen Jesus. I think Paul was so dumbfounded in those first days that he must have sat silent while others spoke of knowing Christ. What a thrill it must have been to Saul to hear their testimony, to have them share with him the blessed experiences they had had too with this same living, risen, and ascended Lord. I fancy that even there were some in Damascus who had seen the Lord. And I hear Saul say, tell me about it. And when they said what they knew about Jesus, Saul would say, that's what I saw too. I saw him too, and I heard him too. Now all of this time passed in fellowship served to strengthen Paul, and he spent many days with them. But you know, there was a realization came to him, a realization that he had received a heavenly vision, so he calls it in one of his testimonies. And he must not be disobedient to it. For the same Lord Jesus who saved him that day had also made known to the heart of Saul that he had been called as a very specially chosen vessel. But he wasn't just saved to sit down and wait for heaven. He wasn't just saved to sit down and talk for the rest of his life about the blessings God had given him. Jesus had something to do, and Paul was going to do it. Through Paul, he was going to manifest himself. And Paul was to bear his name before the Gentiles and King and before the nation of Israel. And he said in his defense before Agrippa, And I was not disobedient, O King, to the heavenly vision. I know that as Saul sat there in fellowship with the saints, enjoying every moment of it, thriving on every moment of it, there must have come what I choose to call a burning in his bones, a hidden fire within that he couldn't fight, a growing conviction in the heart of Saul that he couldn't just sit there in Damascus the rest of his life. He had to get out and tell what he knew. And he had to get out and preach what he had learned. He couldn't just sit there and enjoy that sight himself. He must cause others to see. He knew that the fellowship of the saints was precious, but there was something more precious, being obedient to the Savior who loved him. And I don't want to hurt you. But I want to remind you that sitting in this assembly is precious. Enjoying the fellowship is precious. Feasting on God's Word is precious, and it will build you up. It will make you strong, just as it did with Saul. But you must also realize that in the assembly, and in the fellowship of the saints, and in the strength of the Word of God, there must be that desire of the heart to share with others what you've learned of Jesus. Saul couldn't sit still any longer. In his case, he was called in a very special way to go to many lands, but you're called in just a special manner to go to many souls. You have a job, you have a place in society, you have a home, you have a family circle. Each of us have a circle of influence like a stone dropped in the water and sends its ripples outward. We have a circle of influence no other man can reach but us. We have an entrance to hearts that is closed to others. Our paths cross the paths of others in this life who may never be crossed with the gospel of Christ. 
save as their path crosses ours. And all that we learn of Jesus, and all that we share in fellowship of Jesus, must also serve this purpose in our hearts. It must get us up and get us out, as it did Saul, to tell others what we have learned. He had seen the Lord, and he could have well sat in Damascus forever, just as I could, with the saints and enjoy the things of Christ. But I don't know. I think I understand a little bit about him. He would look around those saints there in Damascus, and he would say to himself, but oh, those synagogues. God knows, filled with men and women, ignorant of Christ, and on their way to hell. And I have access to those synagogues. I have an acceptance there that no other man would have. I can get in those synagogues. I can preach there. I can declare Christ. I can make him known. I have an opportunity that's mine and mine alone. The comprehension was growing that he wrote about in 2 Corinthians 5 that he was saved to live his life unto him who loved him and gave himself for him. And the love of Christ began then in Damascus to constrain him. And it says him straight away, Saul preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. And I, I like that verse because it indicates to me that suddenly he just got up and like a shot out of a gun, he headed for the nearest synagogue just straight away. Oh, he, he was strengthened and he spent certain days with the disciples, but suddenly, straight away, he had to go. The fire was burning in his bones. His heart was aflame. And he began to know what he later wrote on to the Corinthians when he said, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. There was a divine woe upon him. A life to be lived for Jesus, a responsibility to be born out of love. And straightway I see him rushing into the synagogue. And as I tried to describe to you Sunday night, it was the habit in the synagogue to give any visiting rabbi or dignitary the opportunity to speak. And I'm sure that if he came in that synagogue in Damascus and sat down, he was recognized as a very celebrated rabbi from Jerusalem. A very distinguished young man who had made a name for himself in Judaism, who had been seated at such an early age, yet a young man upon the great council of the Sanhedrin. And such a distinguished and prominent visitor surely would be brought before that synagogue to make any kind of remarks he desired to make. And I think Saul, so. he has the look of eternity in his eyes. And he looks into the faces of those godly Jews, for they were godly, they were blameless under the law. And he looks at them and he sees his own likeness reflected. He sees them sitting there in their darkness, hanging on to their synagogues and quoting their prayers and reading their scriptures, and going through the dead and meaningless motions of a Christless religion. And I hear him start to preach. And what's he preaching? He's preaching, brethren, the only thing that he knew at that time. And that was that Jesus was indeed God's Christ and that he was the Son of God. It's the only thing Saul knew at that time. He preached what he knew and he preached it in the power of the Holy Spirit and he preached it in the place that he alone had access to. And that's the key for all of us. Preach what you know. Tell what you know. Leave what you don't know to somebody else. This is where we make most of our mistakes in talking to others about the Lord. We try to expound to them things that we don't really know with our heart. And instead of telling them the one thing we do know, we know Jesus. And that's what we ought to be telling. Leave the preaching to the preachers and the teaching to the teachers, the exhortation to the exhorters, the edification to the edified. But every believer, every saved man and woman, boy and girl, can preach as powerfully, as effectively, in the home and in the school and on the street and in the synagogue, 
as Saul did that day in Damascus. For we can all tell what we know. What did Saul know? He knew Jesus. He knew that he had been wrong about Jesus, and now he was right. He knew that he had rejected Christ, and now he had accepted. He knew that Jesus died, but now he knew Jesus died for him. He knew Jesus had been crucified. He knew that before Damascus. But now he knows he was crucified for him. And he stands in the place where he had acceptance. Oh, he didn't have it long. Get the point? If Saul would have asked me, if I'd have been there, and he'd have said, Brother Hearn, how long do you think I'll stay in the synagogue? I would have said, Saul, stay there as long as you can. And he stayed there through one round. And the second round he came back, and they made plans to kill him. And they had to let him over the wall in the basket. Go where people will accept you, where you can speak openly of Christ and tell what you know. I guarantee you can't stay long. The Holy Spirit won't let you stay. They won't let you stay. But he started out where he was. So did I. So do all Christians. And you know, I'm reading a lot between the lines, but Saul was to be an example to those who would afterward believe. And I'm satisfied that my own experiences and yours reflect his, as well as his reflect I. When I was first saved, the first real heartbreak I knew was the jolting disappointment in the response of others to what I had to say about Christ. Why, when I was saved, it was such a wonderful thing and such a glorious thing to me such a joyful thing, such a precious thing, that I suppose that if I told all my friends, every one of them would be saved. And I suppose if I told the whole city, the whole city would be saved. And I suppose if I told the whole world, verily the whole world would turn to Christ. For I could see. I could see like I'd never been able to see before, and I thought, since I could see, all could see through my eyes. Not so. I think the first disappointment of Saul was in that Damascus synagogue when he saw the stony faces and the closed heart doors of greeting when he told the most precious thing he knew in this world that Jesus was his Savior and God's Christ and Lord and that he'd been crucified by a godless nation and who had set aside the chief cornerstone and were building without him. Can you imagine him standing there telling the most precious thing in the world and seeing the look of actual boredom on the faces of the people who listened to him, shaking his head and looking at each other, and the word says they were amazed. The Greek says they were astounded. They were filled with wonder. They were astonished. They were everything but convicted and everything but saved. They were nonplussed. And what was the source of their amazement? Revealed by what they said. Not that Jesus was the Christ. Their source of amazement was that isn't this the fellow who persecuted Christians? Isn't this the fellow who destroyed them that called on this name of Jerusalem and came down here to Damascus for that same intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? And I thank God that even though they didn't believe, and even though they didn't receive his message, there was a testimony given in that day that they could not gainsay. They saw in him a new creation and a transformation that they had no answer for. You follow me? I thank the Lord if a man gets saved, people ought to talk about him. And this man was the subject of their conversation immediately. 
Have you heard this song? Have you talked to him lately? It must have gone all over Damascus. Have you, have you seen Saul of Tarsus lately? Have you talked to him? What do you make of him? He doesn't talk like he used to. He doesn't act like he used to, and he doesn't look like he used to. He says that he believes in Jesus. He says that he loves Jesus. He says that he once couldn't see it either, but now he can see it. And he was blind, and now he can see it. He was lost, but now he's found. What do you make of this song? Well, I don't know. I'm just amazed at him, that's all. I'm astonished at him. I wonder about him. I remember years ago having conversations with a man who didn't believe of course, he didn't believe anything in the Bible, and he didn't believe anything about God. He believed God was the wind whispering through the trees. He thought God was birds flying up in the air and flapping their wings. <coughs> and he thought God was trees holding up their little arms toward heaven and praying to whoever they were praying to, tree God. And he thought uh, God was just anything and everything that he liked. And he was a very well-educated and a very well-read and a very well-traveled man. A man spent his entire, practically his entire adult life in the army as an officer and had spent seven years in the study of comparative religions. And he thought he was well-versed enough to talk to anyone. And I found out that I was completely powerless to even discuss the things of Christ with him. First of all, he'd taken my weapon. And the man says, I don't believe the word of God. I don't believe anything in the Bible. You have nothing to convict him with and nothing to convince him of. And so I fell upon this last proposition, proposition which I think still stands as the greatest single proof of the power of the gospel of Christ and of the reality of God's saving grace in Jesus. And that infallible argument is Saul of Tarsus. I said to him, well, since you've read so much, you undoubtedly have read the story of Saul. Oh, yeah. What do you make of Saul? I said to him. What is your explanation for what happened to Saul of Tarsus? Oh, he said, there are many explanations. I said, I know there are. What's your explanation? So he named several that he had read, and I'm familiar with those. Some of the most learned rabbis declared that Saul had a sunstroke in Damascus Road and became a mental incompetent. Others say that uh, he had, was a fraud to start with, that he had only taken up with Judaism because he wanted to marry the high priest's daughter. That's the best one I've heard yet, as a little intrigue. And uh, gives a jolly side to Saul there that I've never noticed before. <laughs> <laughs> He kind of had his eye, they said, on the uh, high priest's daughter. And so he thought that if he took up Judaism and became a success, the high priest would want his daughter to marry. And so, as this tradition goes, Saul took up with Judaism, threw himself into it, wooed the chief, the chief priest's uh, daughter. And when it came right down to getting this daughter for his wife, the high priest deceived him. And it made him so mad, he said, all right for you guys. I'm going out and be a Christian. So he went out and said a Christian. Pretty good story. Wouldn't it be easier just to believe what God says about Saul? And, uh, of course, as I say, there are many, many explanations about him. They, uh, they say of Saul that he, uh, he was a fellow that couldn't deal in in halfways, that he was whole hog for something or he was nothing. And he went whole hog for Judaism. Then he got interested in Christianity and he went whole hog for Christianity. And if he'd have lived long enough, he'd have forsaken Christianity for something else. He was a fellow that just liked to dabble in everything along the way. And if Saul had died a week after Damascus Road, I would have had to say of him what I've had to say of so many people I've seen who profess Christ. I would have had to say, well, 
who knows whether he really received the Lord or not. But we have the long look at Saul's life. Thirty-five years. Study his life, take it apart. He was the most analyzed man of his day. The leaders of Judaism tracked him relentlessly like the hound of the Baskerville from one end of the Roman Empire to the other. They hung upon his every word and upon his every writing to find some contradiction, to find some falsehood, some inconsistency that they could hang him with. They did the same thing with Paul's Lord before they crucified him. But in 35 years, they could never successfully defrocking or exposing. He was just what he said he was by the grace of God. He was 365 days a year what he said he was, passionately in love with Jesus. He suffered the torments of hell from the hands of false brethren and the enemies of the cross, and he never wavered. And he never recanted, and never a single time expressed a word of murmur or sorrow over that day on Damascus Road when he first saw Jesus. But from the day of Damascus till the day at Rome, when they separated his poor tired head from his poor worn out body, Saul was looking into the face of Jesus and rejoicing in the love, the grace, and the glory that he had come to know in him. What possibly could have been Saul's motive if he was a fanatic, as they say, and an imposter? Couldn't have been wealth, because we have reason to believe he was wealthy, and he died a pauper. It couldn't have been fame, because he was seated on the Sanhedrin as high as he could go in Israel, without being of the priestly family, which he was not. And he forsook all of this authority and esteem that he had in the Sanhedrin for responsibility among a flock of sheep whose shepherds had been murdered by the nation. It couldn't have been fame because he was the most defamed man of his time. Couldn't have been selfish motives because he insisted even to the point of refusing material and monetary offerings from those he ministered to in Corinth. He said, I do not want yours, I want you. And to prove it, he refused even to receive those material gifts from their hands that they offered him. He learned how to be in need and how to abound. He knew how to be hungry and how to be full. He suffered the worst kind of imprisonment, harassment, torment, and defilement without a waiver, without a change of course. And it seemed that the more the world and the flesh and the devil blew against him, his roots went deeper and his love for Christ more passionate. It couldn't have been for the praise of men, for men hated him. And it couldn't have been to advance his learning, for he was at the pinnacle of education at the time he was saved. He had had all the degrees that could be conferred upon him, and he exchanged all of that precious learning at the feet of Gamaliel for the philosophy of ignorant fishermen. Yea, to summarize, everything he was and everything he possessed and everything he hoped for became done, he said, that he might gain Christ. And there's only one logical explanation for Saul of Tarsus. He had seen Jesus. Jesus was alive, and Saul had seen him, knew him, and loved him, and he was never the same again. Now, Sunday morning, we're going to start right there with Saul and tell you about one of the most important omissions in the book of Acts. A portion of Saul's life is omitted. He tells it himself in Galatians, and we're going to find out what he did 
when he went to Arabia for those nearly three years, why he went, and what he learned, and how it changed him even more when he came back from Arabia, and how it changed in the world the whole program of God, and how those things he brought back from Arabia were the direct cause of each of us tonight who are saved coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for thy word and for the preciousness of Christ and for the power of the Lord Jesus to save even the chief of sinners. Oh, thank you, Father, that you enlighten us and enable us to see him by faith, dying in our place and stand, propitiating you for us and standing in our place. Thank you, Father, for this message tonight. For we have seen in Saul our own life relived. Oh, Father, we pray that you would strengthen those who are Christians tonight and convict those who are unsaved and do it all for your glory and for your praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.